Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. Our church's vision is to have a passion for God and compassion for people. We hope that the teachings in this podcast will encourage you as you seek to follow Christ and grow in your faith. Now, let's get into today's message. Well, good morning, Ritman Grace Brother and Church. How are we this morning? It's good to be here with you. My name is Clark. I'm the pastor here. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, I would love to meet you. I'd love to meet your family after service, and I'd love to catch up with you if we have met. Well, today we are going to be continuing in our sermon series, our summer sermon series in the uh, Old Testament book of Daniel. So I'm excited to jump into that with you. And so if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 4. That's where we're going to be this morning. And as you are turning there, uh, the guy that uh, I'm putting up on the screen here is Mike Tyson. And if you're under 30, then you probably don't know this guy. Uh, But don't get confused. I know some of you thought it was a picture of me with my shirt off for a second, but uh, that's actually not true. I know it's hard to believe. Uh, But it is hard to describe uh, what an icon this man was in the mid-80s. Uh, He was, along with Michael Jordan, one of the 80s great sports phenomenons. Uh, He was a boxer unlike any who had come before him. Uh, He had this whole string of heavyweight challengers uh, that he defeated between 1985 and the year of 1990 that he knocked out in like one minute or less, uh, like 10 of them. And he even had a video game named after him, uh, Mike Tyson Punch-Out. And so kind of a big deal. Uh, Well, Mike Tyson got so rich uh, from his wins in boxing, there was this infamous story uh, about him running out of gas in his Ferrari and just leaving it on the side of the road, never returning uh, to pick it up. He was everything in the boxing world in the late 80s. Uh, However, at the peak of his career, uh, 1990, Iron Mike, that was his nickname, uh, squared off with a no-name fighter by the name of Buster Douglas. And when I say nobody, I mean nobody. Uh, This wasn't even supposed to be a challenge, but Mike Tyson had knocked out his uh, previous opponent in 93 seconds. And so the bets in Vegas were not about whether he could win. Uh, The bets in Vegas were about how long it would take him to win. But Mike was so heady from all of his previous successes that he did not even prepare for the fight. He stayed out late partying the night before, and so you can guess what happened. Uh, Buster Douglas uh, won by knockout in the 10th round. And people were just bewildered by this. Uh, But Mike thought he was special. But Buster Douglas showed Mike Tyson that he was not special. Uh, By the way, uh, that fight proved to be a watershed because after that fight, Mike Tyson's career went rapidly downhill. Uh, Mike Tyson's life illustrates for us a very uh, tragic truth, and it's this. You can write this down if you're taking notes. Uh, The truth is that defeat is difficult, but success can be fatal. Defeat is difficult, but success can be fatal. In Daniel Daniel chapter 4, the uh, chapter of Daniel we're going to look at together this morning, we're going to find out that Nebuchadnezzar is suffering from a bad case of what we call the success. And the Almighty is about to knock him out with a right hook. Uh, unlike the punch that was thrown by Buster Douglas, the hit that uh, God lands on Nebuchadnezzar is actually a healing uh, punch, as we're going to see. And so it's a really crazy story, but it's important that we see this story as uh, the final round between God and King Nebuchadnezzar. And so uh, round one, we'll call it, if you recall, is when God had prospered Daniel and his friends after they defied the king's order uh, to eat defiled foods that were forbidden by the Jewish law. And they said, we're going to obey God, not you. And then at the end of uh, the time of this examination, we saw that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were found to be smarter and healthier and brighter than all of the other wise men. And so round one, we saw, went to God. Uh, Round two was in Daniel chapter two, when God gave Daniel the ability to do what Nebuchadnezzar's wise men could not do, And that is to reveal and interpret mysterious dreams. Uh, A dream about uh, a gigantic statue that was warning King Nebuchadnezzar about setting up a kingdom independent of God. And in that encounter, 
Nebuchadnezzar, we saw, acknowledged that there's something special about Daniel's God, the God of the Bible. And in chapter 2, verse 47, we read, uh, the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God um, of gods and the Lord of kings. In other words, your God is better and higher than our gods, he says. Nebuchadnezzar was uh, a little bit dazed this round, but he wasn't knocked out yet. And he goes on, says, A revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Round three we saw was the blazing furnace, where Nebuchadnezzar set up a 90-foot golden statue of himself and commanded everybody to bow down to it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends, refused to bow down to the golden statue. And then that set up this third confrontation between God and Nebuchadnezzar, where Nebuchadnezzar threw the three teenagers into the fiery furnace. Uh, But instead of dying instantly, like everybody expected would happen, uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees them up and walking around in the fire with a mysterious fourth man that Nebuchadnezzar calls the Son of God. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego emerged from the fiery furnace without even so much as a hair on their head singed or the slightest whiff of smoke on their clothing. And then at the end of this round, Nebuchadnezzar exclaims, and at the end of Daniel chapter 3, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Verse 29, Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other god can save in this way. In other words, this god is one of a kind, he says. Uh, It really feels like we're getting somewhere now, right? Like Nebuchadnezzar might be ready to throw in the towel. But as round four opens up in Daniel chapter four, we're going to see today that Nebuchadnezzar is still fighting. And so Daniel chapter four is God's knockout blow. And so let's take a look together. Daniel chapter four, verse one, it says this to the nations and peoples of every language. Nebuchadnezzar says, who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are His signs and mighty His wonders, and His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. By the way, this is crazy. This chapter of our Bible was written by a pagan king. I just think about how crazy that is. Uh, Verse 5, he says, I had a dream that made me afraid. So as was his custom, he called in all the wise men of Babylon to give him an interpretation. Uh, But none of them could do it. Uh, They were probably a little bit scared because you might remember previously Nebuchadnezzar threatened to have them all killed for making up a dream interpretation. But we get to verse 8 and we learn, finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods in him. Verse 9, I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. Verse 11, the tree grew and grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. Verse 13, In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and therefore before me was a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, Cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the wild animals... Let the animals flee under it and birds of its branches. But let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the the mind of an animal 
till seven times pass for him. Verse 17, the decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. So now verse 19 tells us that when Nebuchadnezzar told Daniel this dream, Daniel was deeply troubled. And he asked Nebuchadnezzar to not make him give the dream interpretation. In fact, notice it says in verse 19, my Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. So by this point in the story, Daniel had learned to genuinely love King Nebuchadnezzar, that pagan king, the one who had enslaved him and the one who killed his parents. He learned to love him, not to admire him, not to approve of all of his practices, far from it, but to love him as a person. Daniel obeyed God's command that we looked at in Jeremiah 29 a few weeks ago to make his home in Babylon, to seek the blessing of its inhabitants. He genuinely loved Nebuchadnezzar. So is that how we are? Is that how we feel about the antagonistic Babylonians around us, whether it be the ones in government or the ones who live beside us, even when they threaten to throw you, so to say, in the fiery furnace? Or your Babylonian neighbors with their offensive yard signs or their offensive Facebook posts? Are they primarily our political opponents for us to overcome? Or are they people who you genuinely love? People who you genuinely pray for, uh, pray for their best, maybe even weep for. Nebuchadnezzar is loved by Daniel. And so Daniel says, please, Nebuchadnezzar, don't make me interpret this dream. And Nebuchadnezzar, who would also learn to trust Daniel, evidently responded in verse 19, just tell me. And so Daniel tells him in verse 22, he says, Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Daniel goes on to say to King Nebuchadnezzar, but God has issued a decree about you from heaven. That because of your pride, you, like this tree, King Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be cut down. Verse 25 says, You will be driven away from all people, will live with the wild animals, you will eat grass like the ox, and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by you for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Verse 26, the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And so Daniel pleaded with King Nebuchadnezzar to repent and to turn his life over to God, to separate himself from his sins. In verse 27, we read, Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Sadly, however, we learn that Nebuchadnezzar did not. And so in verse 29, at the end of the 12 months, the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. So he's admiring its power and its beauty, his heart feeling uh, with a swelling sense of pride over what he had accomplished. And verse 30 says, Is not this great... Uh, this the great Babylon I have built is the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Verse 31, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from the people and live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge the most highest sovereign over all kingdoms on the earth gives them to anyone he wishes. Verse 33, immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. So God has given Nebuchadnezzar plenty of time to repent. And But the day came when Nebuchadnezzar crossed the line and God said, that's it, enough. And by the way, God knows when that day is for us as well. And it's never when we think it's going to be. God says, you have walked in disobedience long enough. You have hardened your heart too many times. You have ignored 
too many pieces of counsel. And in that very hour, he sends something to destroy your foundations, to rock us at the core. And so what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Well, it says that he was driven away from the people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. By the way, we're not exactly sure what uh, seven times means, but most scholars believe it means seven years. But what's probably more important is that the number seven is the Old Testament number for fullness. And so it's the Bible's way of saying Nebuchadnezzar he suffered, from, he suffered from this for the full amount of time. In other words, as long as it took, as much time was needed for him to realize that God was God and that Nebuchadnezzar was Nebuchadnezzar. And so for him to abdicate, abdicate the throne that he usurped from God. And so during these seven seasons, the mightiest king in Babylon was reduced to a groveling madman. He lived outside. He ate grass like a cow. His hair grew out like eagle's feathers, his nails like the talons of an eagle. And by the way, uh, that's another reason that people believe that it was seven actual years. We're not talking about no shave November or a bad case of split ends from not using conditioner, right? Or wearing the same pair of underwear for a week. We're talking about so many years that his hair, the Bible says, became so long and matted that it looked like feathers instead of human hair. And during this time, it says he ate grass like a cow. Right? It was utterly humiliating. It was a moving experience. Sorry, <laughs> I just had to do that. But believe it or not, a psychologist uh, actually have a classified name for this. Let's see if I can get it right. It's called um, boanthropy. So you can Google it. It's a mental disorder that, while rare, the uh, victims believe that he or she is a cow. Interesting. God was using Nebuchadnezzar to give us a picture of what happens to humanity when we rebel against God. Like Nebuchadnezzar, we were created to rule on the earth. But when we reject God, we give ourselves over to sin, we become like beasts. Insane. This is not just true of individuals either. This is true of whole societies that turn their backs on God. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1 that the human race professing themselves to be wise become fools. In other words, in all of our sophistication, all of our advancement and much learning, we go insane. We say things like the human race is nothing more than a product of chance and time and we're all just slightly evolved beasts. No different from monkeys except for our reasoning ability and opposable thumbs. That's insane. We say things like, if you're an advanced parent and you think your 10-year-old boy is really a girl trapped inside of a boy's body, then give him hormone therapy, irreversible invasive surgery to make him a girl. And then if anybody opposes that, then we'll call that a hate crime. It's insanity. So this is not just about Nebuchadnezzar. This is about the whole human race. It's about you. It's about me. But I just want to stop there and reflect a little bit on human pride because that's what's mostly at work in chapter 4 of Daniel. It's the source of Nebuchadnezzar's other sins. C.S. Lewis put it this way, Pride is the mother hen under which all other sins are hatched. So what we're going to look at this morning is the roots of pride, the fruits of pride, and the cure for pride. So let's look at the first one, the pride's roots. In this chapter, we learn that pride has at least two roots. The first one is a failure to see that every good thing comes from God. Every good thing comes from God. When we fail to see that, that is the root of pride. Notice again in verse 30. He said, Is this not the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power? and for the glory of my majesty. I mean, just notice, I, my. There's no acknowledgement that it all comes from God. And so verse 32, God is basically like, you think this is, this is all you, Nebuchadnezzar? I am ultimately in charge of it all. Every talent that you have, every breath that you take, every ounce of strength that you exert is a gift from me. And so God says, I'm going to set up and tear down whoever I want, whenever I want, and you know, for us today, especially Americans in particular, 
you know, we believe the myth of the self-made man or the self-made woman, where many of us can look out at all we have and we're tempted to think or say, I've worked for everything I got. You should have seen where I came from. And look at what I've created for my power, for my glory, and my majesty. And that's not to take away at all from human ingenuity and from your hard work, because I'm a big believer of a free economy. But even the slightest moment of reflection will show us that the whole self-made man or self-made woman bit is not entirely true. Think about it this way. The biggest factors contributing to your success you and I had no control over, such as where we were born, right? the education you received, the society that you were born into, the influences that inspired you to succeed, even the genes that give rise to your talents were ultimately a gift from your parents. Most fundamentally determinative factors in life, you and I had no control over those. You might have worked hard, yes, but you were using the health and energy supplied to you from God. None of us are truly self-made men. We took gifts that God gave us and we utilized them. And to not acknowledge that is cosmic plagiarism. Our entire lives ought to have one gigantic footnote that says, this came from God, not my doing. And so pride's root is a failure to see that everything that we got is a gift from God. And it's always accompanied by the second root. And it's this, the foolish assumption that it's going to last forever. The assumption it's going to last forever. Nebuchadnezzar assumed that he was safe, and re relatively speaking, he was. Nebuchadnezzar was, in his time, the most powerful man in the world. And historians will even say that no more than five people in all of human history would have had the power and the privilege and the wealth that he enjoyed. Babylon, his capital city, located in modern-day Iraq, was the headquarters of the known world. It was an architectural wonder. It was built like a great uh, hanging terrace garden on two different sides of the Euphrates River, connected by a tunnel underneath of the river. Uh, his palace had a 400-foot high waterfall. The city was decked out with jewels and gold. Herodotus, the Greek historian who visited Babylon during the days of King Nebuchadnezzar, wrote, never in his life had he seen such an abundance of gold everywhere. Nebuchadnezzar's capital was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was New York City, San Francisco, Hollywood, London, Dubai, all combined into one. And furthermore, he made Babylon virtually impregnable. He built a wall around Babylon that stretched for 56 miles. In most places, it was about 80 feet wide and 300 feet high. They would race chariots on top of the wall. It was so wide. The point is this. If anybody should have felt secure about the future, it should have been Nebuchadnezzar. He literally could not be attacked. Literally no army in the world compared to Babylon. He could not be fired because he was an unchallenged monarch. He could not go bankrupt because he was the world's bank. But you and I both know that God always has a way. You might be sitting on the top of the world. You might have enough savings for any kind of contingency, especially if you're young and you know you feel like people tell you hey the world is your oyster go and get it but everything changes when a simple three-word diagnosis comes about you have cancer the builders of the titanic boasted not even god could sink this ship but then there's that iceberg there was a civil war general who once boasted that he never lost a battle and it was true but then he became violently ill and he died from a tick bite and just think about the picture of that a Civil War soldier. I can oppose the strongest armies and win, but something just happens to me in my sleep. It takes me out. Maybe this has happened to you this year. Maybe it's one of your kids. Maybe it's a family member. There's no pain like kid pain, something that can reduce the mightiest person by something happening to one of your kids. Maybe like Nebuchadnezzar, it's happening through mental illness. The human body is so delicate and so fragile, so easily thrown off. The point that I'm trying to make here is this. We are not as secure as we think we are. Part of Satan's lie, Sam read it earlier in our scripture reading, in the Garden of Eden was that you will not surely die. It's a lie that whispers in our ears even today. It's not that 
He convinces us to ignore death's existence. It's that he makes us forget about its reality. But we need to live with the awareness that death is coming. We all know that it's coming. We just don't know when exactly it's going to happen. And so right now, we might even be tempted, like King Nebuchadnezzar, to look at all of we've accomplished, our empire or our portfolio, and, and say, look at all that I've built, my power, my glory, my enjoyment. But with one small flick of the Almighty's finger, everything changes. And so pride's root is a failure to recognize that everything that we have, every breath that we take is a gift from God. But secondly, it's the failure to, it's the failure to see Secondly, it's the foolish assumption that it's going to last forever. And so these roots are going to give birth to the fruits of pride. And the first one that we're going to see is, is the fruit of pride is competitiveness. Nebuchadnezzar's language is filled with boasting, right? I, I, my, my. That's a sure sign that you're eaten up with pride. And so you're always comparing yourself to other people not to be confused, of course, with a healthy desire to do your best. Um, I'm talking about a drive to show that you are the best. C.S. Lewis says that the quickest indicator light that indicates you have pride is that somebody else's pride bothers you. I won't put this up on the screen, but I'll read it to you. Uh, in C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, here's what he has to say about pride. If you want to find out how proud you are, the easiest way is to ask yourself, how much do I dislike it when other people snub me, refuse to take any notice of me, patronize me, or show off? The point is that each person's pride is in competition with everyone else's pride. It is because I wanted to be the big noise at the party, and that I'm so annoyed that someone else is being the big noise. Two of a trade never agree. Pride is essentially competitive. It is competitive by its very nature. And so there you have it. So the question is, how much does somebody else's pride bother you? When we get mad, when others get attention, we, we deep down, we want the attention, and it ticks us off because they're something, because deep down we want to be thought of as something, and their somethingness gets in the way of our somethingness, and we don't like that. C.S. Lewis says that pride is a funny disease because those who suffer from it never know that they have it. But they can make everybody around them sick. And so the second fruit of pride we see is ingratitude. Ingratitude. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, the New Testament, said that the reason for the fall at its core was that they neither glorified Him as God or gave thanks to Him. And so gratitude is a sign of humility. Unthankfulness is a sign of pride. When you're humble, you recognize everything you have is a gift from God. And as a sinner, you don't deserve any of it. And so you're constantly giving God glory for it, and you're thanking Him for it. And then that leads to the third fruit of pride, entitlement. Entitlement. Pride says, I deserve good things. Look at what I've done. I've worked so hard. I did some good things. I did something difficult. I sacrificed. I did something that nobody else would do. Right? I, I, my, my. Therefore, I deserve glory and praise and appreciation. More money, a better marriage, better kids a break, whatever. When our lives are going well, pride says, this is how it should be. I deserve this kind of blessing in my life. I am owed this kind of marriage. I am owed these kinds of kids. I deserve this kind of friend. I deserve this kind of job. Thank me. And when things go poorly, pride says, well, this isn't fair. This isn't right. We live with resentment. We blame others we feel have let us down, whether it's your husband or your wife, your kids, you blame God even. By way of contrast, when things go well for humility, humility says, wow, this is a gift. This is mercy. Thank you, God. When things go poorly, humility says, God is growing me right now, which is good because I sure need it. Thank you, God. Pride leads to entitlement. Humility leads to gratitude. Number four, overconfidence. One of the fruits of pride is overconfidence. Nebuchadnezzar believes that his kingdom is going to last forever. In the New Testament, the book of James tells us that a sign of pride is that you take the future for granted. 
He says, don't say that you're going to do this or that tomorrow because you don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. Life is so fragile. It's a vapor. It's a mist. Rather, James says we ought to say, if the Lord wills, I'll do this. If the Lord wills, I'll do that. Overconfidence is seen as a bold self-assurance that says my future is always going to be bright and I always find a way to get back on top. I get knocked down, but I get up again. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. But seriously, a little can-do attitude is great, but we need to realize that we can only do these things as God supplies the strength for us to do them. And so how does Paul say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Overconfidence leads to the fifth fruit, which is self-will. Nebuchadnezzar isn't afraid to go into the future without God. Because he believes that he has all that he needs to make life work. But God is about to show him how foolish that is. Because there was another wealthy king, King Solomon, that said it this way. I believe this is the verse of the week. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of God means, in this context, a recognition of how much you need Him. Think about it this way. I fear God like I fear oxygen. It's not that I'm terrified of oxygen. I just know how essential oxygen is for life. And so I fear being separated from oxygen. And I would never put myself in a situation where I would be without it. Those who go through life without seeking God's will are those who are foolish enough to think that they can make it in life without Him. And so if we're not surrendered to God and seeking His will right now, our problem is not rebellion. Our problem is actually foolishness. So it's like, what is it going to take for us to wake up from that kind of insanity? The next fruit of pride is stinginess and exploitation. Daniel pleads with Nebuchadnezzar in verse 27. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. I think it's significant that Daniel puts repentance in terms with how uh, our attitude is towards the poor, the oppressed. That's because a sure sign of pride is a callousness towards the needs of others. If we feel like we're responsible for all the good things in our life, and we have nobody to thank but ourselves, then we won't have any natural compassion towards those that are poor. But if we realize that even for just a second how much we owed God, our heart naturally goes out toward others in need. So entitlement is a sign of pride, but advocating for the needs of others is a sign of humility. And so Nebuchadnezzar, we see the roots of his pride, the the fruits of pride, and now we're going to look at pride's cure. Pride's cure, which, by the way, is suffering and failure. Maybe that's happening to some of us right now. But failure itself is not enough because failure alone can lead to more bitterness and more resentment. And so God spirit us to awaken in us an understanding of our failure. Nebuchadnezzar's insanity alone did not wake him up. God's spirit had to give him eyes to see. You hear a voice in your soul calling you to look upwards towards heaven. Verse 34, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. I wonder if that's happening to any of us, even this morning. You hear God's voice in your soul calling you to look up. How much more are you going to suffer? Nebuchadnezzar's final statement here might be one of the most stunning declarations of humility anywhere in the Bible. And it's by a pagan king, nonetheless. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. Nebuchadnezzar's flatterers were always uh, greeting him saying, O King, live forever. Nebuchadnezzar now says that epitaph only belongs to God because we're all temporary. Our lives are like vapors in a wind and our kingdoms are like little sandcastles on the beach. Nebuchadnezzar would tell you, don't flatter yourself as if we're all going to remember you when you're gone. The famous Mark Twain even said, the world laments you for an hour and forgets you forever. It says his dominion 
is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. There's only one kingdom, one kingdom that lasts forever, and it's, of course, Jesus' kingdom. And only His kingdom, only what's done through His power will last. You cannot make your marriage work. You cannot make those kids turn out right. We can't build this church in Rittman without Jesus. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't do anything apart from me. Verse 35, all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. You see, God is not impressed with Babylon. God is not impressed with America. He is not impressed with our talents or our money. He has no need for any of it. Our greatest achievements are of no consequences to God. He does what He wants with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. He is fully in charge of history. Armies of angels move at His command, and as does the small, smallest molecules on our planet. We are just inhabitants of the earth, and God is in control of it. He continues, and He says, No one can hold back His hand. His power is irresistible. No one will ever frustrate His purposes. Not you, not Nebuchadnezzar, not Hitler, not Hollywood, not Washington, not Satan, not Donald Trump, not Joe Biden. Nobody. He does whatever He pleases. And He says, nobody can say to Him, what have you done? Verse 37, praise and exalt and glorify the King because everything He does is right and all His ways are just. In the end, we'll see that God was just and true in all that He did. And it's our co complaints about what He was doing that are going to feel foolish. But then our eyes will be open to see what God was really up to. The prophet Isaiah, a contemporary of Nebuchadnezzar, says, On that day, the wisdom of the wise will perish. The, intelligent, the intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Nebuchadnezzar concludes, says, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar concludes by saying, the mightiest of men and women to ever walk the face of the earth, on that final day, they're going to find themselves crumbled in a heap before the king of the universe, unable to lift their heads. For at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue proclaim that Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so that, that's it. That is the conversion. That's the testimony of the richest, most powerful, most wicked king in ancient history. He is able to humble all those who walk in pride. And by the grace of God, that includes me, that includes you, if we come to Christ through faith and repentance. And so what about you? Has He humbled you? Are you ready to listen. The worst thing is for you to enter eternity unhumbled. For God to wake you up through some tragedy is nothing compared to facing the terror of His wrath on the day of judgment. And that leads us to probably the best part of this story. Jesus was the true King. Even though He walked His whole life in submission and humility, at the end of His earthly life, God drove Him into the wilderness of suffering and He died like a beast on the cross. And because of that, He can forgive us our sins and restore us to our sanity. And so now He calls to you here this morning in the midst of your insanity to come to Him, to separate yourself from your sins, to humble yourself and surrender to Him. The question is, are you ready? The pain in your life that you're going through, He's not trying to punish you for your sin or indicate that He hates you. He's trying to wake you up. We often, I've often heard it said, He's not trying to pay you back. He's trying to bring you back. He wants to restore you. And so will you listen? Let's close in a word of prayer. Well, Lord, we just come before Your throne of grace and we praise You and we rejoice we rejoice that, Jesus, you alone are the king of the universe, that you're sovereign, 
You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You're the Alpha, the Omega. You're the beginning. You're the end. And Lord, we just want to confess to you this morning that we all struggle with pride in our hearts. Forgive us for all the ways that we have fallen, for all the ways we've uh, faltered and failed, failed to see that every good thing comes from you and you alone, or operated under the false assumption that this life here on earth is going to last forever. God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, for restoring us to our sanity. And God, Jesus, would you help us to see that you're not trying to pay us back. You're trying to bring us back to you. Help us, some of us, even for the first time here this morning, God, to know you, to come to know you, your son Jesus, through faith and repentance. God, we pray all these things for our good and for your glory. Our church's mission is to follow God, share his truth, and be examples of the love of Jesus to all. If you would like to know more about us, you can visit our website at www.rittmangrace.org or drop by anytime for one of our in-person Sunday morning worship services. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the Rittman Grace Podcast.